live. Okay, we are here. Hi, I'm Jim Provenzano, arts and nightlife editor for the Bay Area Reporter. And with me is veteran photojournalist Rick Gerharder. This is the first of our Bar Talks series or BAR Talks series. That's a pun on the old uh, hookup pages of the old BARs. So <laughs> Rick is uh, also the guest curator of a new exhibit at the Historical Society, GLBT Historical Society, that I'm going to try to show. It's on the web, whoops, it's on the web page now. And Rick's gonna talk a little bit about that, as well as his photojournalism and his other personal work, uh, his work with the Bay Area Reporter and some travel, hopefully if we can get to that as well. So I'll take that off. And hi, Rick. Hello, Jim and everyone else. Thanks for coming. I think we have about 30 people here from Facebook, but I don't know. Um, no, it's not yeah. live on, uh, on YouTube. Let me redo the thing. Hold on, give me a second. Oh yeah, it is live on YouTube. So go to everyone, go to the YouTube thing. If you're, well, if you can see this, then you're, you're already here. So can we start off with talk about, um, well, when did you first get into photography? Well, as a, I guess throughout my life, I was taking snapshots pretty seriously. Um, I, I've always been visually oriented, you know, sort of attuned to even as, in junior high school would, you know, notice advertising that caught my eye and stuff like that. Um, but it wasn't a, a, a profession until about the, the late eighties and a friend and I spent nine months traveling in South America. And that really inspired me to, to do more of that type of travel. And photography was just a sort of a natural way that fit with some of my skills to do that. So mm -hmm. I came back here to San Francisco, went to city college for about two years to learn some of the technical aspects of black and white photography, darkroom work and such like that. And then just started taking photography or taking photos of news events. And um, it came at a good time for me um, because it was shortly after I started doing that, ACT UP and, and all of that activity happened, which of course was very visual. There was a lot to cover. It was of national and in some cases international interest. So, you know, it expanded the market and that kind of established me. And early on the BAR, um, when Brett Averill was a, the editor, which was several editors ago, um, he hired me to take photographs. So, which was in 87. 1987. Yeah. So um, how did you, how fast could you turn around uh, a photo assignment in the film days. Did you go to a lab or did you shoot, have your own lab? When I was in high school and even junior high school, we developed for the yearbook and other stuff. We had a lab at school and um, that we would use with all the equipment and stuff. But how did you turn stuff around for the paper quickly? No, I, I always had a small dark room. The first one was really small. It was in the, uh, it was like Harry Potter, that the kid that is under the stairway and Harry Potter. Uh, <laughs> Doby. <laughs> Forget his name, but he's a great character. Dolby, yeah, Dolby, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when I was at City College, that was the dark room that I would use sometimes, particularly because I started um, selling photographs while I was still in school, so I needed a quick turnaround. Yeah. Which, you know, primarily with a weekly, of course, they're not near as much as it it would be with a daily. But the turnaround would be, I could do it in a few hours overnight. Would be, you know, so it'd be the preferable. Right, and. Um, I could develop eight rolls of film at a time. Uh, you, you, the the, the yeah, biggest stars, cylinder, the cylinder, yeah, the, the yeah. biggest cylinder has room for like four reels. Right. If you do it back to back, you can get Long eight ones. in there. Yeah. So when I would go to a major event like the March in Washington or, you know, the Gay Day parades here, and need a lot, you know, shoot a lot of film, it would be a way to speed up that process. But of course, with digital it's less time consuming. You still go through some similar processes, not so much the development, but the editing process and such. And, and when, when was the tipping point where you went all digital versus you were still doing both or digitizing print or when was when did that big change happen? I, f I forget exactly. I suppose like 10 years ago, I, I, I forget it, frankly. 
Um, I was not an early adapter, so it was sort of late into the game somewhat before I went to all digital. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't really remember. <laughs> Tone blur. I mean, I could find out, but of course, by looking in, you know, into the archive that I have. But and see, yeah. And those are photos behind you. Is that those all photos? They are. They are. The, the, I don't know which. <laughs> These are the black and white by month. You know, there's those contact sheets and all the negatives are in there. So it, it, it something they never really explained at City College of how you organize your work. And I do have my work organized so it's easy to 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 find material, which you know has been an asset to the paper for sure because it's very easy to find older photos of people or events or things like that. So so that's been yeah. very helpful over the years. Yeah. If we didn't, as as editors, and for me as well as a contributor, freelancer, et cetera, if we didn't have a kind of photographic memory or a calendar memory of what time of year and what year a photograph was published in association with a certain article, you couldn't find it because uh, we didn't, we weren't filing uh, JPEG photographs by photographer name at all the time. I I did as soon as I started, and I suggested other editors do the same thing because you want that photo by Rick of that event. And you know, you can't remember it if it's just called image one, two, three, four, it's 27. Um, or even folders that have the proper, you know, naming categories or keywords. And that's something I learned on early in the internet days was when you post a photograph and it's just image 27, that doesn't help. But if it's me, like, uh, let me show off in 2002, if I can share screen, um, just a little moment that if you can see that oh. in 2002 i did uh uh i was commissioned to do a stage adaptation of my first novel pins and rick took this wonderful photo of me it's actually in color and there were many others but back then the bar would do tints they would have one ink color per issue and not always full color pages so that's kind of my uh alphabet precursor i guess <laughs> before wicked um I remember that photo at new conservatory theater right yeah in 2002 it was it was great and i and, and i had my shoes off because it was the the set was a wrestling mat so it just i, I thought it looked really good it was lots of compliments about that and it sold many tickets so thank you as well as one more let me just do one more of before that and this is going to really age me out quite badly but you took a headshot of me for my first novel, Pins, the wrestling novel, with this gargantuan dictionary that I still have. My computer monitor is on top of it, and those are some little wrestler guys. But, oh, to be that young and have that much hair, once again, that's not going to happen. <laughs> so let's talk about um, the um, Historical Society exhibit you guest curated. Again, I'm going to share the, pa the web page, and you can just talk about your process of how you started doing this. I mean, when we were like, the, the historical study asked us, Mike Yamashita, our publisher, and Cynthia Laird, the news editor and editor in chief, who could guest curate this, you were the first person we thought of, not only because you scan, photographed hundreds of photos before the historical society's archives were scanning full editions of the paper for our 40th anniversary. So you had the responsibility of editing uh, uh, the preliminary archives of what th were the best covers. And you did that excellently for the 40th anniversary. And uh, so anyway, as well as being so encyclopedic with your own work, I think that was what led to us saying, oh, Rick, yeah. Rick, Rick can do it. So let me wacko the screen and then I'll show the screen again. And you can talk a little bit about how you started working on this online exhibit, Stories of Our Movement. Well, like you said, the bulk of of the work I had done, at least the bulk of the selection I had done for the 40th 10 years ago, when I did, you know, flip through at the Historical Society, flip through every page of, right. of the paper and took photographs of significant pages, interesting things, things that caught my eye, you know, just a, a huge variety of things that I thought were significant. So mm -hmm. that was a starting point. So the first thing I did was go through the, 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 the next 10 years, which was online, and do the very same thing, you know, make notes is what I would have thought were significant. And then myself and some other people, Ramon Silvestri and, and Nalini Elias, I believe, at the Historical Society, and we worked together to sort of pull some themes together. 
for it that would just somehow organize this a huge amount of material. You know, the paper has been weekly for 40 years in a very busy, large community. So there's a huge variety of stuff to, to sort through. Right. So from those themes, we pulled, I pulled, you know, the different things that, that are, for the most, a surprisingly large number of what I selected made it to, to the, the site, to the exhibition. So, and, and the thing too that's, that I particularly like about it, if you scroll over one of those images, right, you'll see that it has a brief caption, but then a link to the full issue. So with that full issue, you, you, oh. you, get, you, you just get sort of the wealth we of context that a newspaper provides. Uh, right. And, you know, queers in San Francisco are involved in every aspect of life in this city. So the things that, that you know, the journalists, photographers, and writers cover in this city is just virtually any aspect you can think of. Yeah. Gay people are involved, and the BAR has covered it at some point over the years. It's, you know, we would put this out in our discussions and, like, what hasn't been covered? What aspect of life hasn't been reflected in the community and in the paper? And we really couldn't come up with anything. <laughs> I'm sure it's out there, but... It it makes it it makes it difficult to decide what to sorry let me let me move that to decide what to do what to include because there is so much we're also doing along with the other 50th anniversary celebrations we're doing a, a news and for my section arts and nightlife are doing what we what I think Scott Waslowski our advertising VP coined 50 years in 50 weeks we had 50 weeks in the next calendar year to do one a week one short little piece just showcasing one page or one cover. And it, I'm trying to figure out the next week's 1976, and I already have 10 favorites. Um, oh, the YouTube yeah, week. Sorry, I'm getting uh, – let me let me give people the YouTube link because I'm getting some chat folks who did not get it. Here's YouTube link. Yeah, go to YouTube. It's working live on there, folks. And hi, Dan Danny Nicoletta. Ah! <laughs> hi, Danny hi, Dan. Nicoletta. <laughs> um, that every sure, week they? we're doing – 1975 was the year when um, Ron Williams, a veteran photographer uh, in the early BAR days, took a picture of Empress Doris X, Doris 10, on the top of the elephant in the uh, Gay Freedom Day Parade, which got so much, so much, you know, it's it's a favorite. And you picked it, too, for many of our best of slideshows. And also, um, there's a video from that, it's the 1975 Gay Day Parade, or... I forget exactly what they called it back then. Um, Gay Freedom Day. Gay Freedom Day. It was. It, anyway, she, it, it includes her on the ele um, on the elephant in that parade, yeah. which apparently went. I in, have a, to the financial district, maybe to Polk Street. I'm not quite sure. It went uh, uh, north to south on Polk Street. Yeah, north except, to it, south downhill. You can see that it, go, it went through the financial district too. There is there is a, okay. a, a screen. Uh, in the exhibit that was an ad for one of the very earliest parades that had the route as part of the ad. Oh, it, yeah. There were a lot of ads with like little maps on them, old BAR things. With uh, I, I remember seeing those. where There were also um, bar lists, lists of bars and things. I don't know if I can find it here. But, yeah, here's some, here's some lovely Empress candidates from 1970. Uh, anyway, that's great. So you what, know, without, just, without question, there was a lot that that you you know there's no way you can include. But the fact that it's all online and it's very easy to access the full issue from each of these these individual images or articles is you know it really is just an incredible wealth of information there. Yeah, here are and you know, eyewitness information of the paper covers a huge amount of things that nobody else covers. You know, it, there's a huge amount of original reporting in the paper, and and you just don't see it anywhere else. No, no, I'm I'm looking for some of the older. And here's a way you could do it if you want to look at the old stuff. You just click on apply filter for the year, and then instead of all the issues, boom, we're back in the 70s. And this is where so many, you know, uh, uh, you just remember there was this terrible arson. There was the the. the uh, political things there were and you can just page view through all these fabulous pages with all the old ads 
which I love the old ads. They're so funny. It's fascinating. I mean, it is fascinating to do exactly this, read some of the things. It's such a, sna a snapshot of a time and a place. And, you know, it's just phenomenal, the changes for the gay community. For yeah. The queer community. It's, it's, it's really been a huge amount of progress in just so many different aspects of our lives. A lot of amount of progress in fonts as well, <laughs> and graphics, graphic design. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> no, I really admire it because, I mean, the originals, just like we did with the high school yearbook in the 70s, this is actual pay stuff. This is stuff on a typesetter machine and photo stats, if that, and graphics and clip art. And uh, I just, it's very charming. I love, I love looking through the old issues. So tell me a little bit more, let me turn this back off, about um, your own work. You have another, you have a folder of some photos of uh, covers that you wanted to share? Yeah, I can go through, um, let me see if I can work this. I should be able to. We were able to get, folks, we were able to get a lot of things done in our tech run, so <laughs> hopefully it'll, it'll work. And if you have comments, put them on the, on the StreamYard. Uh, comments in the chat comments and Rick will answer any questions that are that are above board. Okay, Jim, if you can. Oh, show the thing. Duh. Okay, add to stream. There we go. So these are, are, are some random um, shots, paid shots from the Bay Area Reporter that uh, I particularly like the photos in it. I like how the photos are used. Um, and, and let me get this up there. So I can... So the, the first one is a photo of Vito Russo when he was at Outright Conference in 91. And I don't know if you can see there, but the reflection in his eyes, this is shortly before he died, too. Mm. Um, so the reflection in his eyes just made for a very, very haunting photo. Right. Um, right. Mysterious next one. Is just sort of an example of some of the work and how, how the paper has used it. <clears throat> of some youth that were writers, uh, DJ, The Bear Rendezvous. Oh, that's a classic. Everybody loves that. Yeah, there's several that, <laughs> yeah, I, I like that photo a lot. The, the infamous Peggy Sue. This was an ACT UP activity at the INS office, now ICE, and that was occupied. And there's Dr. Uh, the, Fauci. Dr. Fauci. <laughs> and I mean, this, this is what's so fun about looking at the full page is you can see all this other stuff that, you know, the ad for the AIDS Foundation was groundbreaking and controversial at the time, I remember. Yeah. And the, the Hartford Zen Center what, this is one of the photos I've used a lot in different work. Um, really do like that. A photo, a special photo that we took for the cover of the Pride section. Mm -hmm. um, Let it all hang out day. Is that um, your photo on the top there? It is. It is what a photo I really like. And this was a photo that, <laughs> the, I believe, I'm, I'm, as I recall, they call themselves the Fat Dice. And it was prompted after someone wrote this really snotty letter to the BAR about all these fat lesbians walking around Castro Street with, you know, improper clothes, blah, blah, blah. So <laughs> these women took it, grasped the, it, and had this sort of like Fat Dyke Pride Day. And they danced. This is at Harvey Milk Plaza before mm -hmm. it got modified the first time. And they just had a little dance party. Uh, this is a queer nation kiss in the next one, and it oh, acts yeah. up the, the alcohol boycott. Act up boycotting yeah, course beer. Miller, Miller boycott. Yeah, uh, and that was a, a queer nation kissing a table or turn around. Oh, uh, it's like the photo of the guy with the boat lip sync up when she performed at Josie's. Oh, Josie's. An act up demonstration of some sort. I just, you know, I think it, photos used really well on that page. So that's an example of a moment really perfectly caught. I mean, an, an action, a protest, those are photo friendly because so many things are happening and angles and people. How do you, how many photos did it take to get that one kind of shot that really exemplifies the energy and the zeitgeist of that moment? 
Well, it really varies. It really varies. Of course, now with digital, you can tell, you can sort of stop sometimes, you know. Um, but with this, most of what we're seeing here is film, without question. It was all shot on film. Um, so something like that, you know, they were shouting in unison, I would guess. And, you know, maybe five or six try to get it so that their fists aren't in front of their faces, so their faces right. don't look, you know, too distorted. Because when people are screaming and eating and things like that, you can get a lot of bad, bad photos. Yes, yes, I've seen many, yeah. That, so that is a kind of dynamic, a physical dynamic of being a photographer in a crowd of people, say, or in a gathering, where do you have a kind of choreographic anticipation of movement where you expect they're going to go like that and then you wait for that? I mean, it, that's the dynamic that I'm, I'm fascinated by that I've been able to do a few times with my sports photography over the years. Well, you know, with the act up thing, it, it, I would just ask, and I, you know, I was well known. I, I was part of that community and worked with with many people, you know, and did a lot of publicity. I, you know, sort of my role was to kind of spread the word the best I could. Yeah. Um, with some, some artful photography, and you know, with news photography, there's there's a number of limitations. One of which, you're on an assignment, so you have to produce something. And you want to tell the story, whatever, you know, like what's, what's the story or what's the main hook, the main, main um, topic of, of the article, of the news story, of the event. So those limitations, you know, sort of um, so, are there. Yeah, that many other types of photography do not have. And just, with the act of demonstrations, I would just ask, and you know, which ways it's going. And there's a certain kind of a routine to these. Um, of course, you look for the most visual aspects, whether it's dress or you know, costume or signs or or whatever, and uh, go from there. Yeah, be move. You know, they're very physical demonstrations. Of course, in March is very physical for a photographer because you do need to move around. Yeah. No, I, I remember being witnessing things, and you know, as a gay man, you want to join a march, but then if I brought my camera and I didn't know if you or Jane or someone else was going to be there, the the objective journalist in me starts framing the event as opposed to being a, in a part of it. I want to go to the chats and just related to this, John Winters. Hi, John. Asked um, if some of these are Jane Cleland's. Uh, Rick is mostly showcasing his photos this time, but there are other photographers' work in the newspaper pages that we're seeing right now. Rick, uh, John also asked, do you have any sense of how many demonstrations you've attended over the years? No, no several hundred, I suppose, overall. Um, and there's certainly photos of Jane on some of these pages. Jane Cleland we're talking about, another photographer who's been at the BAR as long as I have, which is about 35 years. We both started about the same time. Both have mostly been freelancers. Yeah. and. Uh, you know, she she also has some really beautiful work. We've we've cooperated on some exhibits and and such. So there are some photos of her that just appear on these these screenshots without question. But yeah, no, the ones I'm highlighting are, are the the ones that I've taken. Oh, okay. There's from the Bear Rendezvous, um, the photo of James Broughton there on the right. Oh, that's so much, yours. It is. Yes. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. That, multiple times in portfolio work without the type of course mm -hmm. yeah it's one of my favorite photos and it's very early that's i took that photo actually i took that photo for the bay time for the coming up for coming up before the bay times okay i like so, how se abrupt segue the graphics notice how the graphics how the designer sculpts the, the the text around the branch and around James's shoulder. This is a very 90s thing that was used a lot because we didn't have a lot of, always have a color cover for the section or a high bright uh, page, uh, paper quality. But whoever, I think that was Adrian Ro Adriana Roberts who was the layout designer at that time. But I love that interaction that you see there with the photo and the text and the headline that really, it's really sweet. And just to clarify, as a Freelancer, the 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 the, the I, I retain the rights to the photos, and and it, you know and you have used them, and of course my my photos have appeared lots of different places. And, yeah, uh, let me roll off a few. My gosh, uh, like Gay by the Bay, the book, several, but Witness to Love, Stories from the Heart of the AIDS Epidemic, Out in America, 
Um, oh, other, and some of your other exhibits include Capturing the Moment, the photojournalism of Rick Gerharder at the Historical Society when it was downtown, Havana Panorama, that was shown at Mad Magda's Russian Tea Room, Una Verdad de San Francisco in Havana, Cuba, which we'll get to later, Homo Photo San Francisco at the Valley Women's Art, just all kinds of places. And your stuff is also available with Getty Images. You license your photos as well, right? Yes, I've submitted photos to them, although I frankly haven't done that for the last few years. It was originally a Lonely Planet. Um, you know, it was a contributor to Lonely Planet in many of their travel guides. Mm -hmm. uh, because the true impetus for me being a photographer was to travel more. And I, w I have been able to do that without yeah. question. And Lonely Planet was bought by Getty Images. And and so now they circulate the photos. It's a stock house, so that they keep photos and then they make the sales to a wide array of publications and posters and movies and, and all. Oh, okay. Yeah, and that's how it works. So I want to say hi to Ron Williams in chat. Ron will be one of our guest photographers on June 3rd, I think, on the Thursday. He just said yes, um, with Pride Photos, with along with Gooch. They'll both be on board. We It took a while to figure out how to show multiple images and slideshows, so um, hopefully we'll be able to get even better for the next step. But I really appreciate, Rick, your work on getting these seen so we can see what we're talking about because it is such a visual language. One comment, this photo here in the cemetery, which is actually, the, the, I guess I, I kind of forget, I can't read the caption. That was the first photo I had published in the BAR. And it, it was, a, as I recall, this would be in 87, I believe it was members of Shah, Shahar Zahav hmm. who were there for some, some remembrance or memorial, I, I don't remember exactly, but you can find out by going to the vapor. <laughs> right. Well, that's a, one thing I, I would encourage folks to, uh, Castro uh, held hostage. I mean, these are classic, classic. Yeah, that was a pretty amazing night. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, when it was an act up demonstration, October 6, 1989. Um, it was, it started at the federal building and then marched to the Castro. When I drove into the civic center to park my car to, to, to start, you know, the, the, the assignment, it was clear that something was different. There were so many more cops and there was just a huge amount of police presence. It, something was different. And sure enough, before the march had even left the civic center, the police liaison, you know, from the, from the activists had been arrested. Oh, so it deteriorated from that point and yeah. then led into, you know, trials and, and a, a lot of repercussions. Yeah, that was a wild night. That that happened um, a lot with um, protests since even the Harvey Milk days and afterwards. But uh, le focusing on being a press member during such a, a, a dangerous situation, how did you navigate that? Was it the you know the thanks to a Zoom lens that or you know we? Oh, no, that was this. The zoom lens don't work. You have to. And I prefer I use I use wide angle lenses a lot, and in this case, it's almost essential if you can get so close, you know. And with a press badge, you have some, which I do have, that's issued by the the San Francisco Police Department through the Bay Area Reporter, and it, it does give you some access, but they can say no as easily as they can say yes. Mm -hmm. So you just try to be careful. And I'm not a real, you know, like a real aggressive, brave type photographer, so you just be careful. And I have been I have been hit once by a highway patrolman at a act up demonstration in Berlin game at Burroughs Welcome. I was jabbed like in the you know like the I guess the kidneys where the kidneys are the lower you know mid mid section. It was yeah. extremely painful. Um, so you try to be careful. But sometimes another experience. I was arrested briefly. Um, this was a demonstration at the federal building at 450 Golden Gate. And I, people were, were sitting in front of the entrance. And so I walked up there to take some photographs and right in the little L cove where the entrance is, there was no one standing there. I said, hey, this is a great perspective because I could be in front and everything. So I step in there and get arrested because before I had gotten there, the police had said that nobody could stand there. I had not heard that warning. So that was that. And so they took us upstairs and held us for the few hours and then let us go. There was other journalists that were that were arrested at that time too. I believe these were protests against U.S. intervention in El Salvador. Okay. 
So I don't, there's more. Oh, here's when I was first there it is. VAR named staff photographer. I was a staff photographer about a, a now, little that's old. a that's a nice portrait though. Yeah. You did article there? Yes, yeah, so it was when I was hired by Brett Averill, partially on on those photos from the October 6th demonstration on Castro Street. And I, I worked for about a year, and then I wanted to take like a two or three month trip. And that was the end of being a staff. But, you know, the, the BAR has been extremely, extremely kind to me. I've left for, for weeks and months at a time. And I will get assignments the very next day when I return. So oh yeah, oh, yeah, we'd be like, "Is Rick in town?" Oh no, who's gonna do it? <laughs> on the travel that I've been able to do. So tell me about engaging a subject like with this church, high church angle. Um, again, as we discussed offline in our tech, there's a certain well, style that your photos have that I can maybe because I'm f very familiar with the our variety of freelancers and staffers, but. Your style shows through. Is it the rule of threes? Is it just a compositional thing? Is it the the the, the qu texture quality you gave your print film that you've moved over into digital? But I'm curious about that, about your style, if you think you have one. And as an example, how and why you set up this portrait makes it even so much more interesting with the, the, the window behind it. I do like wide angles, um, which includes a lot into the, the image. So I try to fill the image. I generally don't have to crop my images right. after I take a photograph. Yeah, we don't have to. Uh, so, you know, some of the images that work best for me are when there's multiple elements in them and it comes together in, in some cohesive way that, you know, I've chosen that little chunk of the world to, to isolate. And that all the different elements in that 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 chunk comes together. And if you're on an assignment with a news event where you have to to represent something, and you, your photograph has to tell this story in some way or represent it, um, it's a fun challenge. It really is. Sometimes it works, and of course, sometimes it doesn't. Um, in this case, this is about the Lutheran Jeff Johnson, all the trouble that the Lutheran had with you know gay and lesbian pastors. And this is at St. Francis Church on Church Street. And it's just, you know, a very clear image of a religious setting. Right. A, 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 the, uh, a stained glass window like that. So, you know, with an environmental portrait, that too is a nice challenge. You walk into an environment that you, you have not seen before, that you're unfamiliar with. Um, you may know it's an office, but that just tells you a little bit about what the actual environment is. So what what can there be that is interesting that will make for you know an exciting visually pleasant photo tells the story represents the person you know just what other elements can you put into a photograph in a portrait such as that which is yeah. what we would call an environmental portrait and then there's that um, likewise here's an, a, a, another church photograph oh yeah um, okay. this, um, I forget the name of it it's the Episcopal Church on the corner of 15th and Julian. It's a great community church. Yeah, it really, they've done a lot of, of of great community activities in the North Mission. Hank Plant, when he was at KPIX. Who could Hank Plant? Hank Plant, yes, that's okay. where he's at that big desk. Oh, I see. Okay, it looked like a sled. <laughs> no, it, it's 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 in the 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 um, studio. Oh, okay. that's the desk that he read the news from behind. <laughs> And he told me at the time, I remember, that he, he liked, his mother liked that photo so much that I made him a print and gave him Aww. a print. I think of it, as I recall, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, do you have, you had some portrait photography too, like from your website that you wanted, we wanted to share as well. From, I'm sorry? From your website, your portfolio stuff on the website. Do you want to segue to that? Okay, let, let me, um, I have to do some very advanced, um, I, I don't know, advanced something. Yeah, well, you fell around with that, and I'll, I'll go through some of your other, the other work you may have seen that Rick do is uh, group exhibits in Daily and Transcendent at the San Francisco Public Library. 
out at the library, also at the library. Um, and you contributed some to the Sporting Life exhibit that I guess curated at the old uh, Historical Society Museum downtown, Becoming Visible, the Invisible cul Culture at the Parsons School of Design. Huh. Um, and then also another exhibit at the DeMaio Fine Arts Gallery in Guerneville. Yeah, that uh, was an exhibit on um, uh, gays in the military. Oh. When that, I remember when that was like an ongoing issue. Yes, so, yes. Um, you know, Jim, what I'm going to do is um, do the, the um, these are portraits. Oh, great. Okay. Let's go with that. Um, yes. Let me get it to the beginning. Um, these are portraits that, is it, is it on, Jim? Okay. Yeah, a guy added to the stream. Okay, let me start there. Oh, great. So these are th these are, are um, various portraits that I've done over the years. Many have been printed in the paper, some not. Uh, they were used in a show that Jane Cleland and I had at the, the San Francisco Public Main Library called Daily and Transcendent. And it was a portrait show that we had, I don't know, five years ago, something like that. This is Arthur Tress. Another local photographer. Yeah. Although I don't think he's lived in San Francisco real long, but Brandy Moore, who was an aide to Willie Brown and various other other politicians, Diet Popstitute, who, uh, you know, it's it's it, a lot of the photos that a lot of the people I see when I'm looking for photos and going through the contacts, you know, a lot of them are dead. Of course, it, mostly because of AIDS, I would guess. Although, you know, as the years go on, it's old age too. But um, yeah. there's a lot of, of poignancy in looking at Jacqueline Woodson. Now, here's an example I think shows, which I'm quite pleased that it was a hotel lobby. She was staying at a, at a hotel and her striped sweater and the striped um, paneling behind just made for a very simple, but I think very effective photo. But you also left a blank space where a journalist or a, a copy editor could like add a headline or something that that the, the yeah. use of full space and then blank space as well is something I noticed. Although I probably wasn't thinking that, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is Roberta Actenberg and her son, Benji. And, That's just adorable. Uh, That's from 1990. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Joe so, Hormel. He's like 23 by now. Now, uh, what, Hal Paul, go ahead. who he ran, uh, was in the Tenderloin. Those are all porn tapes. <laughs> yes. Uh, what was, oh, I forget the name of the theater, but he had this massive collection of porn tapes. And in addition to that, he is, a, a his, he, you know, he is as significant as a po gay pioneer as Dell and Phil or Jose. You know, he was one of the original, if I, get, I may have this all wrong, but he was one of the very earliest out, you know, pioneers trying to get gay people some respect and legal protection and dignity. Yeah. And in later life, he became a pornographer. Well, a collector. I don't know if he... A collector, I yeah, and, just, and a exhibitor. I don't think he ever made it. Yeah, interesting guy. Wonder what happened to all those VHS tapes. <laughs> that could all fit in one, one external hard drive. And that was but one room. He had several aisles set up, like if you remember the old video stores where there was like, you know, very narrow aisles and just racks of videotapes. Yeah. He had about two or three aisles like that in addition to this this room. And then in front of that nice couch, which, you know, obviously is room for more than one person, <laughs> that is facing a TV bank of, I believe there was five TVs. Five. Oh, my goodness. That's... It, this was, was it called the J.O. Club? I forget. <laughs> anyway, each of the videos that was running in the rooms downstairs were also running on. Jim Van Buskirk says it was the Adonis Theater. Thank okay, you. Okay, there it is. <laughs> God. That's Terry Sutton, who was a very early AIDS activist and died early on. That's from 89. That was a, that was a sit-in at the pharmacy at General Hospital um, trying to get Foscarnet approved or cheaper. I, I kind of forget what the actual issue was. But Fosconet was a drug to prevent blindness, I believe, which was one of the side of 
Facts. Scary Garrels, who's a curator at uh, MoMA, in front of Mark Roscoe painting. So there's the the um, Hartford Street Zen Center photo. Rainbow, who is a dancer in performance. That's at Kizar Stadium, I remember. Oh, David Weissman says uh, that maybe it was the Circle J Theater on Turk, which I think is a straight bar now. Thank you, David Weissman. I, I, that sounds right, more than the Adonis. Because it yeah. wasn't a theater. It was a jack-off club. Right. And there's, well, at that point, she, they were called Justin Bond. Right. No mix. Oh, column for the paper, Glam on the Rampage. It was a great column. It was, you know, all the, the cynicism and humor in her Kiki and Herb persona came through in her column. It was a great column for, I don't know, a year and a half, something like that. Yeah, it was when, in those days, it was 92 to 94, somewhere in there, that I would go downstairs when uh, freelancers would come in with their little square discs and a printout, and if the if the disc didn't work, we would scan it and then scan to text or have to manually transcribe it. But Justin, would Justin now Vivian Bond, would come in with that along with other freelancers and just dish for a few minutes, and it was always a special once-a-week time. I'm going to try to get Mix into a chat because um, – they're coming up with uh, Feinstein's is announced they're reopening in person. And oh, good. Justin is going to be one of the performers coming up. So, yeah. There's Lip Sync again. Fabulous Lip Sync. Do you know she's still performing? Um, Lips is on the social medias and did a little online thing, but not for a while. Um, not that I know of. If I don't know if she's still in the same style of performance, but it was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Michael Lumpkin at Frameline, who's had a Frameline for a long time. Heck, Lena. Those are the lights of the Castro Marquis. Oh, right. Okay. And was that, yeah. that was one of the, they did a show with a movie at the Castro Theater? I forget exactly what I could find out, though. No, that's okay. It was 24, <laughs> 2005. I could find out, but I don't remember Just what it was. Pull open it's one of your drawers and see what pops out. Sandra Bernhardt. And here, you know, here's an example. You know, it's a very simple photo, and there was not much. She was on an empty stage, a black stage, before her performance. It was like a press preview of some sort, sitting at a table. And you gave it a sense of drama, of a, of a, of a almost off kilter yet balanced symmetrically in composition. But you provided a bit of tension, I think, that probably would not at all exist if you just did a straightforward photo or even a side profile photo. I, I agree. It's Rachel Maddow. When she was a punk. When she, well, this was when she, when she was a Rhodes Scholar. This oh. was the, she was the first lesbian to be a Rhodes Scholar. Wow. And, you know, she, she's from Castro Valley, and um, she was home for Christmas. It's taken 12, 24, 94. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was given Bevan Dufty. She was in town after she became, you know, the glamour star that she is. Today, she was in town for something, and Bevan Dufty was going to see her. And I mentioned this this photo to her and to him, and so I made a print, and he gave it to Rachel. Oh, great! Although I've never heard from her since. I, she no, she's it. busy. <laughs> but anyway, I really do. And here again, you know, a photo very simple, not much to work with, but I really do like. It. And of course, she's she was very gangly baby dyke at the time and so that and the wide angle all of those add you know to that perspective yeah uh, definitely yeah. oh yeah another another one that really just says so much more than just a portrait yeah. or a headshot it's in his apartment oh that loft yeah. out in oakland yeah it was uh, emory Vero, oakland somewhere there the Vito russo there you can see a bit those those rays much, that are yeah, much coming more, yeah. out. in the old jack tar hotel <laughs> there's Steve Finley and Michael Bachton in Bruno Heights. Michael Bachton was an AIDS columnist and activist and just, you know, really an, an ex ex excellent, excellent writer. He really did some, you know, fabulous pieces about AIDS and had, living with AIDS. Yeah, um, and with Disease Brian News, um, it, was, it was stunning, stunning work. Yeah, Michael was... That was a real loss. Two guys at the fair or at the parade. <laughs> uh, what Family the Lake. 
who who um was a a chantreuse, I guess, huh? Bambi, yeah, that's Bambi, yeah, yeah Bambi. Bambi Lake. That's that's great. I mean, it's so it's so ready, re ready made. Pret a porter, red with red. Is that Folsom Street Fair? She was walking around, and I asked if I could take her photo, and she said no. <laughs> and she posed. So <laughs> it was like Greg Taylor. He used to always when he was around. People will know who he is. If good, good, do. Greg. Yes, good old Greg. Greg. He would when I would come around, he'd go, I smell a photographer. I smell a photographer. <laughs> <laughs> and he was. And he, you know, he was great. He he was visually, he made good events and he looked great. He, you know, he was he was fun to photograph. Oh my god, the product days, those were those were legendary. Yeah. Yeah. Brent Frisch, who had a cartoon for many, I don't know if he still does, but did Sort of bear cartoons and bear magazine used to be our neighbor at the old bar offices on ninth and harrison this, this is in the back of the lone star it was and he yeah uh this is a i don't know Folsom stephen borgu i guess i just like hmm. well what attracted to me was how his beard sort of matches tattoos right it's, oh, that's pretty cool. More is more. More is more. I always wonder, like, things like that. We'll get to the John Carr photo, but things like that where, like, drag shows and leather, you know, street fairs, they seem almost too easy because people are dressed up or flamboyant or outgoing. It it, it seems, I mean, I, I generally, if I look, I look back at some of my Folsom photos and I went the Diane Arbus route of, like, you know, someone collapsed and in the corner next to a garbage can or something because the general hi here we are um just has been done so many thousands of times how do you find something different like that like you with this leather photo you can see his partner's reflection so that's doubled you can and and the facial hair matches his hat, tattoo and references the leather straps so so i'm seeing multiple um references and visuals that are all tied together like a jigsaw puzzle it's not just here's a hot guy at Folsom. Well, it may be easy the first time around, um, but then it's, and it becomes quite a challenge. I mean, not just for the street fairs, but, you know, a lot of the things that I've covered over the years are the same events over and over and over. The pride and, comes with balloons. Yeah, you know, drag comes to mind. Drag is wonderful to photograph without question, but it's essentially, in most cases, a performer on stage. Um, so it's... A, challenge i don't know you just work you know there's always something new and there's always a new angle if you can find it but most every parade there's certain things that i've never seen before so but it, it it's a challenge it is it is well also the classic you know people holding banners you want to see wait for all the letters to be visible so you can get that so it's kind of perfunctory documentarian in one way yeah, yeah and, and the other side, it's like, well, here's here's someone in a limousine or you know a hoodless car, a uh, convertible. Uh, but other times, yeah, like mics on bikes or whatever, it it, it has a the, a moment of rarity is hard to find. It's something that's so photogenic, it seems. And the, you know, street fairs are what I was mentioning earlier about trying to have multiple elements that sort of m merge into a successful image. Street fairs are great for that. There's a lot of activity. Um, so that's one thing I try to do. A wide angle lens facilitates that. Mm -hmm. um, I've also worked with the panoramic camera a bit, which is sort of about two and a half sizes of a regular 35. Like the photo of John Carr, just think that two and a half size bigger. And really? that's, yeah, and a panorama. It has a lens that swivels. Uh huh. Um, so it, it, it's fun. You know, it's fun to play with that. You, you don't know what you're going to get many times, until, particularly with the panoramic. Anyway, it's John Carr, who for many years wrote the porn review column brilliantly, week after week, brilliantly. Um, and plus, he did, he, he, he's written other things, too. He was the art editor first in the 80s. Yeah, that. Yes. Uh, this is in, he's a, he collects tassels. Oh, is that what that is? That is. This is in his house. I figured that. Like, he didn't just go somewhere. Jack Fisher, hi Jack. Speaking of leather and fulsome, Jack Fisher shows up. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Robert Chesley in his apartment, which was oh. so sparse. Kind of, he was a, a playwright. 
Um, and this is from 1990. Yeah, interesting guy. And there's the Broughton photo again. Oh, okay. That's that's it. And so the uh, Adriana w rubbed out the corner yeah. of the wall. Yeah, without the type. And um, yeah, I really do like that photo. It's a hard photo to print. It's a very hard photo to print. I did all my own black and white printing. Never learned color. You, cropping I, and cropping and, and fading get the it, it's never the right angle or i mean the tint would you do a lot of that in the manual well, days the, the particular things that was difficult as i remember in this was to try to get some detail in that white right you know the white background the white wall um and so there was a lot of dodging and burning involved in this oh okay fairly difficult okay. thing to print but it was yeah, I remember, I remember trying that in high school, and it was always a fail, uh, often a fail, because, it, or else you'd you'd get the whole, you know, you'd be off by half a minute with the developer or the fixer, and then the whole thing would come out bare and you know too pale or too dark. It it, it was amazing. I still love the smell of photo flow though. So, I like the juxtaposition of the Robert Chesley one with the James Broughton one right next to each other. So have you thought about doing other, what along with the, you have the exhibit up now, you're working with us with the paper, you have other stuff coming up that you want to mention, the exhibit? There is. There, um, this was delayed because of the pandemic, but in 1990, the International AIDS Conference was here in San Francisco, and this was at the peak of ACT UP. So there was a, every day had a theme with marches and demonstrations. So it was a huge amount of activity. And I, I've covered a number of International AIDS Conferences, six or eight, something like that. So it was it was planned to, to be here last year for the first time since 1990. And it, they did have it, but it was all virtual and everything, of course, got delayed. So right. at the public library, um, we, myself, my photographs of all the activity in the 1990 conference, and then Liz Heileman, and, who writes for the, the paper and has for many years, and Tim Kingston, who used to write for the Bay Times for many years, both who covered the conference in 1990, wrote the didactics, wrote all the material for the, 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 the this exhibition, which will now, I think, be... At, so that was delayed because of the pandemic. Then it was going to be only an online exhibit, which we have already. It's all been ready to go. Mm -hmm. And then the woman who was going to do that at the library has been a disaster service worker ever since. Ooh. So they haven't been able to finish it. But now that the library is reopening, hopefully by the end of June now that this exhibit will be a physical exhibit in addition to an online exhibit mm -hmm. um, about, I believe it, the title is When the Conference Heard from the Streets. And it's about all the activism that happened at the 1990 International AIDS Conference here in San Francisco. Oh, okay. You know, of course it was, it was slated to, to be up concurrently with the, the conference last year, uh, which would have been cool, you know, because the, the, the AIDS, the world of AIDS is very, very different 30 years on than it was in 1990. Tell so me about it. it. <laughs> Sorry? No, uh, tell me about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's a very different world. So, you know, that history I think is really important because part of the reasons that it is a a better, different world for, for HIV is because of all these, you know, crazy people screaming in the streets. So, so it, it's, it's, and it's still, you know, will be, will be interesting and the great photographs, of course, and great writing, of course. Um, but so it, it will still have, have, you know, definitely historical value and, and, and pertinence, even though it unfortunately is not at the same time as the present, you know, as the, the, the conference last year. Yeah, I think the most pivotal people would agree. Pivotal image is the taking of the Golden Gate Bridge photo. Is that yeah, one of your that frequently awesome. sold and licensed and used, or it has been somewhat? Um, I was the only photographer there. I mean, this is an example of you asked earlier about, uh, um, you know, how do you know which way the march is going? I mean, I'd worked with the, the activists for many years, and they trusted me, so they they asked myself as a still photographer and a videographer. Um, and then our group at that point, what I did is I took the photographs and then um, went to the Associated Press, who bought them, and then they would circulate them throughout the world. Right, and, and it did get published a lot. It did the blocking of the Golden Gate Bridge, which was a dramatic action that got you know, and and this is, 
you know, has been one of the pleasures of my work that I feel I was able to contribute to the significance of that action. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it, that, yeah, that, those have been published a lot. They have, they have. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating to see things that, um, I, I didn't do that action. I, I didn't go to that, but I went to Montreal and other, um, I act up stuff in my New York days uh, and to see the still images, they kind of become your memory of what you don't remember. Um, as well as it can distort it if you choose to, if a photographer or an editor chooses. But mostly what I see is accuracy in some of the, the historic, now historic documentary footage or, and um, and stills. I just finished uh, my write-up for next week's issue of Sarah Shulman's Let the Record Show, A History of Act Up New York. And it's fascinating to see how she and the people she interviewed perceived an event. And then I, I was over here, so I saw this way. I saw it differently. Um, and that's where the photographs kind of fill the blanks of how did you remember this historic moment? How did you, you know, um, see it and perceive it? And, th and that's where it's fascinating. But um, yeah, the bridge photo is definitely the photo from that, you know, whole and, weekend of events. And I, th I think one of the things that's often overlooked about photographers, news photographers, is that we witness it. You know, we can't do an interview over the phone or like, like writers can do and often do do. Photographers really, we can't do that. So, you know, we and I was able to add that perspective to to, you know, going through the page by page by page and trying to sort out, well, what is more important and, and what really had more significance at the time? It may have felt like a really big deal, but it really didn't have that much significance over the period of time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, having directly experienced many of these events. Um, I, I believe that added a, a valuable, you know, perspective to, to the project, to the exhibition. It did. Well, do you, but do you think, I mean, really, this is off topic from photography, but do you think documentation of a 30 year old demonstration w has or will inspire anyone to do the same for their own cause? Uh, uh, sure. You know, I think history proves that you know, people see a, a personal example for me is, you know, I've read quite a bit about the civil rights movement, Taylor Branch's books, for example, and, you know, the 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 strength and the bravery of these people is truly inspiring. And, you know, it, it, it you know, it, it gives you hope. It, 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 it proves that things can change, that people do have power, you know, that you can influence things for, for, for the better. And so, I, I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's always been a huge part of my work is being able to document uh, a place at a time. You know, I've always loved history and still mostly what I read are history books. <laughs> and so, you know, I feel I'm very happy and pleased that I've been able to contribute, you know, this piece of documentation along with other photographers. You know, San Francisco has been really lucky has had a long history of, of rich photography, you know, from Ansel Adams and every Dorothea Lang and all those folks. But even within the, you know, the gay community here, you know, lots of really good photographs that are still working. You know, there's easily half a dozen of us that have been out there for many, many years and we each have our strength and we each, you know, have, have our contribution to make. I love being able to, I wish I could include hundreds of photos every issue, uh, but it doesn't happen that way. But I, li I like being able to look at a photo, seeing it randomly and recognize it. Like I said, with yours, with Gooch, mm. with with Jane, um, there's certain, Mark Geller, there are certain photographers who are like, oh, if you understand what they photographed and know their history, their CV or their chronology, and even if you don't, their style, their look, um, that, that's that's what I, I, I'd love to see a group exhibit to show. Here's a dozen photos of by you and Jane and Mark or whatever, or, and Gooch or, or, or Ron Williams to show the variants and the, the specific styles that it seem to in, embody a lot of the photos that each photographer makes. That would be an interesting show. That really would. Give that me $100,000, Guggenheim Foundation. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that, because, that's, that's the that's the thing that surprised me is I had oh I should print out some of my photos and like you rent a, a coffee shop or something or beg to have an exhibit. It's not cheap to print photos anymore, is it? Yeah, it never never really was. And framing is even you know putting on a putting on a show is quite expensive. Uh, I've done several of them and yeah, they're quite expensive. They are to do. And then if you're not putting them up for sale, then you have to store them. You don't want to take them apart or whatever. So there's that, right? That's partially what's above these file cabinets. Okay. 
<laughs> so you, you can reassemble them if something else. They don't sell. <laughs> Sorry? You try to sell them and they don't sell. Although I've, I've sold considerable, particularly Cuba. I've, you know, we haven't really talked about Cuba, but I've spent a lot of time in Cuba and have done a lot of photography work throughout the entire country of Cuba. Oh, yeah. For Isla. And uh, yeah, sold a tell lot me, of those books. Tell me a little, we have more time. We can go a little over. I'm, I forgot about to make, bring up your travels. Can we focus on your international travels and Cuba and the Byzantine way that you ha still have to go to get there? Well, I, Trump, you know, he tightened it up. Um, the last time I went was on a charter. It was a direct flight from Miami to um, Havana. And what a ripoff. You know, those Cubans, that's the only way that Cubans could go when all the embargo was really tight. Uh, under Obama, you know, they, they allowed uh, private flight, regular, normal commercial flights to Havana. But previous to that, the Cubans had to take these charters, which are just a complete ripoff. Um, but as it is now, um, you know, I had to apply for a license, uh, a commercial, um, a license to travel there. Um, I was also fined for traveling there one time because I spent money and I was stopped when I came back and I had, they confiscated the rum and they let me keep the posters. <laughs> in fact, they did not confiscate the rum. This was in Canada. They made me go back into Canada and get rid of the rum. So I walked into a liquor store in the airport and sold it. <laughs> they didn't want to go all the paperwork that they had to do if they were going to confiscate this bottle of rum. Wow. And I got, I forget what I got fined, like $2,000 or something like that for, wow. for spending money in Cuba. That was, I had bought a plane ticket to go to Santiago, to Cuba. And yeah, you know, it's, it's so I, as far as I know, Biden has not changed uh, those regulations about visiting Cuba. He's uh, has made a few little minor things about what money people can send, I believe, mm -hmm. although I'm not completely up to date on that either. Okay. Okay. That That's really crazy though. That's strange. How, I mean, how are you supposed to eat and where are you supposed to stay if you're not allowed to spend money while you're there? But good. That's the point. <laughs> yes. I understand it. I, I don't, I don't get that. Did you, yeah, well, did you like, did you, nobody does. <laughs> it, it's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Department has, of redundancy. Department of redundancy. Ugh. Did you have when I did um, Sydney when I went to Sydney uh, for Gay Games in two thousand two? I bought um, I think thirty rolls of film. I shot thirty rolls of film, and I didn't want to take any risks, so I had it all developed while I was in Australia, and they, they were terrific. They're my last ever print assignment that I did. I went digital after that. Did you, when you're in your travels, do you develop your film before you leave so that they don't, you don't worry about whether they can? Sometimes. It depends. Sometimes I've been able to sell the photographs in the country that I'm in. So I, I, I've, I've done that. But generally, no, I have brought it home. I've brought it home. Yeah. You know, like Good separating it. Oh, no, I don't, you know, to try to put the film through, through the check at the, at the airport. That was a hassle, and sometimes it was a big hassle, actually. Really? Oh, no, it won't hurt it. Won't hurt it. Well, it won't hurt if it goes through one time, but each time it goes through, and if you're you know, going to go through security multiple times on a trip, which is very possible, it, it affects it. So, fortunately, you don't have to do that anymore. I was coming through um, a family trip at the holidays, and was it 2000? It was right after 9-11, and some dumb security agent in Cleveland, Ohio, opened up my camera. <laughs> and, and ruined an entire roll of it was Christmas tree photos, but still, I just was gobsmacked by how stupid he was, and I just wondered if that something like that happened. But yeah, no, not that's never happened. They've had me take off the lens so they can look through the camera, which I'm not quite sure what they think they're going to find or what they, you know, even if a I troll at all. <laughs> I, I have no idea what you can hide in there, but they do. Heathrow is the worst. Yeah, really. Not, my experience, Heathrow Airport in London has been the absolute worst. Okay. And I mentioned that to a few of the people at the airport. And they, oh, really? Well, we don't mean to be. Oh, we don't, you know, like they were so sorry to hear that. <laughs> That's the nice country you go to. Yeah, definitely. No, I guess they think they watch too many episodes of Man from Uncle. They think everything's a weapon, you know, spy pen or whatever. If you have like one favorite photo you can grab onto that we can close out with, that would be wonderful. If not, we can just say, um, uh, not really. Well, you can I, go to remind us of the website. For your yourself, yes. Rick Gerharder Photos .com. That has 
a variety of photos that I've done of various subjects and things. Uh, there's that. It hasn't been updated for a while, but the photos still are the most beautiful photos you ever see. That mm -hmm. hasn't changed. That's um, <laughs> and to see the uh, online exhibit, go Before to abchistory.org. I would like to thank the folks, the writers, the editors I've worked with over the years, the other photographers who haven't gotten in my way, and those that have gotten in my way. Well, for those. <laughs> thank and, you, uh, go eat a squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> and most importantly, you know, all those all those queers running around that have let us take their photographs for years and years and years. Truly, truly, so, yes. Uh, the, is cool, yes. The creativity of our community, it would be a much more boring world without question. Oh, Danny Nicolette is reminding us that you had a camera stolen at Heathrow. Is that right? Or you, you, no, you yeah, didn't. Well, it, was actually, it was close. It was the Victoria bus station. Oh. I was on my way to, to the, the gay games in Amsterdam. Amsterdam, right. A freelance photographer has to save money. So the freelance photographer didn't want to fly. So he was going to take the bus, which is better anyway. And yeah, I was buying a ticket in Victoria bus station and somebody came and grabbed my camera. Oh yeah, you remember you telling me about that? I was at the ticket in counter. Pot shop, in the pot shop with Darlene and I couldn't get high because I was, I was wrestling the next day and I was worried about drug tests. They never did drug tests for pot in their, in their wrestling tournament. I should have gotten high yeah. the day before. I would have been so relaxed. Anyway, that's the sidebar. <laughs> but you know, the, the, the positive note perhaps to end with is when I came back to San Francisco, I put out like a, a, a fundraising letter and got, I forget, several more than enough to replace my equipment. So, you know, that, that was very heartening. It was. That's sweet, that yes. Was before even before even GoFundMe existed. Yeah, so it was just a letter with a, you know, a photo with my tale of woe and uh, people sent actual idea. checks. Sorry, wow. people sent actual checks. They did actual checks. It's true. That's, that's terrific. No, no stamps, please. <laughs> <laughs> Green stamps. Well, thank you again, Rick. I really appreciate you helping us kick off our first Bar Talks series. We'll have Ron Williams and Gooch uh, Jan, uh, June 3rd, I think. We may have some more celebrities. Uh, we may add more per month because it's just so much fun to do. So thanks, uh, Rick, for your participation. And All thanks, right. everybody, for joining in. I'm going to end the thing. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Oh, and uh, everyone subscribe to the YouTube channel because if we get 100 subscribers, then we can do a, a specific Earl that, that's YouTube, you know, Bayer Reporter at YouTube. So subscribe on YouTube. Thank you. Bye. Uh, so this will be archived on YouTube? Yeah, it's going to self-record and then it'll be up there. I don't know about Facebook Live. I, didn't, I wasn't able to figure it out. I think it's working there. So.